Hello, everybody. Welcome here to Wine with Jimmy, the channel that provides you with all your wine educational needs for the WSET. And I'm your host, Jimmy Smith. Um, so we're going to be looking here at wine production for the diploma. And this is uh, must adjustments under the heading of general winemaking options. If you have any comments, questions or concerns, you can get in touch with us. You can do so via the social media you see at the bottom of every slide or by the comments here on the YouTube video below. So please make sure you click subscribe as well or direct at winewithjimmy.com. So let's begin here with wine production, looking at what you, what a winemaker can do to the must. Remember, the must is the definition of what's been liberated from the grapes. So, of course, this is uh, the juice, but in combination potentially with things like the skins uh, and also things like pips and so on. So it's about what can happen then to the must prior to fermentation. And we've got a picture there of bags and bags of sugar in a winery, which will be a consideration for some places in the world for the addition of sugar. So we're going to be looking at three parts to two must adjust adjustments. So looking at enrichment, incorporating chaptalization, reducing alcohol, a smaller section, but talking about things like uh, reverse osmosis and then acidity, um, the uh, really the addition, the addition of acidity and of course the subtraction of it. So we'll go through both of those. Now parts two and three are only available on the e-learning portal, that's winewithjimmy.com. Uh, this part is available to everybody as free content available on YouTube. Okay, so let's begin with must adjustments. So as I mentioned, winemakers can make a number of adjustments to the must. The general aim of this is to really create overall a more balanced wine. Uh, and that's especially if there has been an issue or a compromise in achieving optimum ripeness of things like sugar, acidities, tannins, and of course, flavors. It's not always perfect, it's not always a perfect science from the vineyard that those four components are, are exactly everything you need. So it may be that they need to be tweaked at the wine making stage. So adjustments to the must are generally made after must clarification for the white wines of the world. And uh, adjustments can, though, be made, of course, after fermentation and throughout the wine making process, of course, as well. But uh, really, we're talking about must adjustments just here. And before we do get uh, stuck into this just a little bit bit of word about history now in the first sort of major civilizations to to sort of span most of europe and that is phoenicians uh, and then the greeks and the romans all of those were found to be adding honey to their wine um, not necessarily to the must initially but to sweeten wine but it was also added eventually to the must to increase potential alcohol levels. Uh, so that's, uh, of course, the sugar component of honey. Now, that's important because sugar through things like sugar cane, dry sugar, sugar beet, etc., was not available in Europe until the European expansion into the Americas and then bringing back the goods of, of sugar. So honey was the sweetening agent, both for um, increasing the potential sugar for potential alcohol for the must and then the sweetness level overall. So very typical. And in fact, they um, they called it mulsum, M-U-L-S-U-M. Uh, and also other things were added like spices, medicinal herbs, uh, all of those things uh, as well. Um, and a typical drink, that mulsum drink, was actually uh, four measures of wine and one part of honey in terms of the sweetness level. I thought that would be quite interesting to include. Okay, so just a little bit on early enrichment, I believe, but we're going to be talking about how it affects wine today. So here we have enrichment as a general topic. So it is common practice for winemakers in the cooler parts of the world to enrich the must before or during fermentation to increase the alcoholic content of the final wine. This is normally done to the must, however. 
Uh, in the European Union, the term for enrichment refers to a range of practices. So that includes everything here that is on the slide. So you'll see the addition of dry sugar, the addition of grape must or grape concentrate, uh, and of more commonly rectified concentrated grape must. This is R. CGM, which is um, industry manufactured flavorless syrup from grapes. Uh, bought, you can see on the left side, this is actually like a 20 liter bottle of RCGM. Uh, so it's uh, flavorless, odorless, it's just full of sugar. And that is used to, of course, bump up the musts for wine making. But also something which is often forgotten is that enrichment also has processes, not just additions, but processes which are listed on the right hand side. So things such as the um, really concentration processes, uh, things like reverse osmosis, uh, also vacuum extraction and then chilling or uh, cryo extraction. So um, really chilling down the product. Um, now, in practice, the addition of sugar is done when fermentation is underway because yeasts, of course, are already active and therefore can cope better with the additional sugar in the must. Um, suddenly piling it on during the fermentation may be uh, a bit of an issue. It may cause stuck fermentation. So, so yes, it's normally done before, uh, and then the, the yeast through well, all of its different types of yeast will then be able to convert that into alcohol. Now, um, just a little bit here about um, chaptalization and how it came about. So the common practice of adding dry sugar is known as chaptalization. The group sort of name is enrichment, but it's more, I think, classically known in winemaking circles as chaptalization. And that's named after the chap here. Sorry, chap, chaptal, too easy. Uh, this is Jean-Antoine Chaptal. Uh, and it really, in the early 19th century, he was uh, credited for the role of adding dry sugar, or at least making it available to the industry uh, within France. Uh, so it's very much associated to that. Now, Jean-Antoine Chaptal was a scientist, a polymath, um, a very important character, certainly during Napoleonic times. Uh, and he was uh, the French Minister of Agriculture, uh, too. So he was tasked with some of the roles, including overseas territories where sugar was being hugely produced. In fact, overproduced. There was such an overproduction that... Um, really genius techniques were needed to be found to put that sugar to use. And one of those was to bring it across to France and add it to musts to increase potential alcohol. And this began, of course, the uh, the, the real industry of the addition of sugar into, into musts. The source of sugar can be uh, beet or sugar cane. Uh, and chaptalization has caused some controversy, certainly uh, immediately in the old days when Jean-Antoine Chaptal introduced this, um, the discontent and the unhappiness of the French wine industry was because really um, advantages were then being given to all types of winemakers. And it's it really, I suppose, caused a bit of a lay, uh, an even um, a playing field between uh, cool climates and warm climates. And I think the warm climate people are getting a little bit angry because cool climates can, of course, now start to produce more alcoholic style wines. Now, in response, there were quite violent demonstrations by protesters in 1907. And the French government began regulating the amount of sugar that could be added to wine as a result of those protests. OK, so um, a few figures here. It is actually quite difficult to find the exact amount of information regarding all the zones across Europe. There's a lot of conflicting uh, information out there uh, and plus a lot of dated. Um, so be very careful when you are looking at some of the um, details, certainly if you go to very generic sites such as Wikipedia. Uh, so let's just talk through this slide, however. So within the EU, there, of course, uh, chaptalization is allowed normally in the cooler parts of Europe. Uh, warmer areas, and we're broadly saying southern Europe, Mediterranean, etc., are not permitted to add sugar, but they can add grape concentrate or rectified concentrated grape musk 
uh, within, of course, certain parameters. Now, that's interesting. Uh, so one thing we also have to add on is in it just in, in case there is a very specific year, maybe, I don't know, some big freeze comes along and very unusual weather patterns, it may also be a special mandate to be allowed in warmer areas uh, in that case. Uh, but with rising average temperatures in Europe and, of course, in many parts of the world during the growing season, there may be less and less requirement for enrichment in the future. And certainly because our knowledge and understanding of viticulture is certainly the best it's ever been. So getting the maximum out of the grapes in, in terms of sugar, but also ripeness, flavour profile, etc., is certainly at the highest end it's ever been. So wine regions in the European Union are split into different zones that determine the level of enrichment which is allowed. Uh, and this will also be corresponding to other types of um, must adjustments such as acidification and de-acidification. And here on this table are two examples. Now, it's a zone A and then zone C3B, which are actually right at opposite ends of the spectrum. There's many zones in the middle with their, with their own sort of rules, but they will sit in within the numbers uh, that you see here. You see zone A, which incorporates most of northern parts of Europe, specifically Germany, but not Baden, which is very southern, and of course the United Kingdom. The natural potential alcohol one must achieve to be classified as wine is 8%, but maximum achieved by enrichment on top of that is 3%. And the final wine, if enriched, the maximum allowed is 11.5 and 12% for red wines. And then in places like most of Portugal, southern Spain, southern Italy and Greece, this is zone 3B, 9% minimum natural alcohol, maximum enrichment 1.5%, but remember only through the means of um, RCGM and grape concentrate, and then the maximum alcohol level if the final wine is enriched is also capped as well, but this time at 13.5%. Okay, um, so we've just talked about the addition of sugar. What about the processes that we uh, mentioned a couple of slides ago as well? So sugar levels in musts can also be concentrated by technological advances, uh, meaning the types of things like removal of water, for example. So things like reverse osmosis, um, vacuum evaporation and cryo extraction, which is freezing of the must or even the final wine, which will remove the ice from it, so really the water, thus concentrating what is left behind. The first of these two, so reverse osmosis and vacuum evaporation, uh, are expensive because of the initial uh, cost of the scientific equipment and machines that is needed to carry out the practice. So therefore, this is limited to really wines of very premium nature that, that can afford this kind of equipment. Um, or those that are, of course, producing such exceptionally high volumes of wine, the investment actually would be quite a good investment to make. The last one, though, which is cryo extraction, tends to cost a little less. Now, be a little bit careful about this, because if you do find information regarding cryo extraction, normally it will immediately point you towards cryo extraction in terms of uh, production of ice wine, by freezing the grapes artificially, but we are actually talking about the um, the must here. So we are talking about the production of normal wine, not necessarily ice wine. Uh, but cry extraction is more widely used out of these three. But in all cases, we are reducing the water content. So therefore, this concentration process will mean there will be less overall volume or wine to sell as a result. Okay, so that brings me to a conclusion for the first part of Must Adjustments. I do hope you have enjoyed it and I hope you have found it useful for your impending WSET studies and examinations. As always, uh, if you do have any comments, questions or concerns, you can get in touch. Uh, you can do so via the social media you see at the bottom of every slide, by the comments section here on this video on YouTube, or by direct at www.winewithjimmy.com, where you can find my e-learning portal. 
Uh, if you do find yourself in London, please do come and see us. You know, we have wine schools and we have a bar. So come and see us for a class, a glass or a bottle. I've been Jimmy Smith. Thank you so much. Thank you.